אני ירון בורק, אני הולך לרצות היום בתשע, תשע בערב. תשע ברבע. באיזה שעות. על מה אתה הולך להרצות? על הפרי רקוויזיט של מדינה חופשית. מה זה פרי רקוויזיט בעברית? ההנחות הבסיסיות. מה צריך, מה צריך בעצם בשביל שתהיה מדינה חופשית? בשביל להילחם בחירות. אוקיי, okay, בהצלחה. <laughs> אני מתכבד להזמין את הדובר המסכם של האירוע, של הכנס, דוקטור ירון ברוק. ירון ברוק מנהל את מרכז העניין מזה 15 שנה, מזה שנתיים מעורב גם בפעילות בארץ ותומך בה דרך התמיכה האינטנסיבית של מרכז העניין העולמי בנציגות המקומית. בשבוע האחרון הוא הדגים את המאמצים הגדולים גם בשבוע של קפיצות מתא, קם, מתא סטודנטים לתא סטודנטים בהרצאות שכיסו פעם או פעמיים ביום. ואני שמח לסכם את כנס החירות השני עם הרצאתו, התנאים ההכרחיים הנדרשים למהפכה של חופש, ההרצאה תועבר באנגלית. בבקשה, ירון. אוקיי, אנחנו נעשה את זה באנגלית, אני מתנגדת, אני מתנגדת לכמה מכם, וכמה מכם, אני חושב, 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 Like every few minutes is a little confusing, so I'm gonna have, my mind is going to take a little while to get used to speaking uh, English for a few minutes. So, congratulations. I think we should all congratulate Boaz on, a, on an incredible conference and a, and a new success. And I know there are a lot of people who helped uh, Boaz, uh, but I don't know who they are, so sorry, I can't help. Thank you, personally. Um, I also want to thank you. It's uh, 9.15 p.m. at night. Very few audience would stick around this late uh, to hear lectures about free markets and economics and, and technical stuff like that. So you should be congratulated for having the, uh, the, the patience and the stamina to stick around and be here. Uh, I think we started uh, at 10 a.m. this morning. So it's been a long day. Uh, I actually really like being at the end, in spite of the fact that I know half of you are asleep and, and it's going to be quite a struggle for me to keep you awake. I like being at the end, and I particularly like coming after a whole series of economists who have explained in great detail and, and quite effectively the value, the economic value, the economic value in terms of wealth creation, the economic value in terms of uh, standard of living, the economic value in terms of quality of life, the economic value to the poor of free markets, of a free market capitalist system. And economists have been doing this for decades. I mean, we have no shortage in great economists in our history as, as, a, as a movement that advocates freedom. Uh, you know, you could go back to Adam Smith, and since then we've had great economists after great economists after great economists to be teaching this, to be explaining this. It, it's not just that. As uh, Professor Moab just said, right, I mean, uh, take care of rent control, right? I mean, the literature is unequivocal about this stuff. I mean, the facts of reality are right there in front of us. We know it doesn't work. We know it hurts the people it's trying to help. And I, I disagree with him a little bit about minimum wage. I think the evidence there is quite unequivocal as well. Price controls, there's a principle. Price controls never work on anything, no matter what you put them on. All this we know. And even if we didn't know the details, you just have to have eyes in order to see that free markets, that capitalism, that wherever it's tried, to whatever extent it is tried, it is an enormous success. I asked my audiences, how many of you have been to Hong Kong? And I assume it's not going to be a large number, but anybody here ever been to Hong Kong? I mean, Hong Kong, you don't have to know anything about economics. But Hong Kong is living testament to the success of free markets. 75 years ago, Hong Kong was a little fishing village with nothing there. Hong Kong has no natural resources other than being a port. We've got lots of places in the world that can be ports. It was a fishing village. Today you go to Hong Kong, and seven and a half million people live in Hong Kong. And it's got skyscrapers. It's got more skyscrapers than Manhattan. GDP per capita, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of GDP, but GDP per capita, a measure, one measure, 
is equal to that of the United States of America. They've done in 70 years what it took America 250 years to do. And they have a very minimal social safety net. They have very minimal regulations. They don't really have a central bank. They're basically on the dollar, on the US dollar. They have a very limited government. And they've been unbelievably successful. We know anybody with eyes knows if they're honest, that free markets work. Work in a sense that we just heard, in the sense of revachah, in a sense of wealth, in a sense of, uh, uh, of standard of living, quality of life, in all of those respects. It's out there, the evidence is unequivocal. And you know, if you're an economist, you certainly know it, because not only do you know that it works, do you see it in reality, but the theory shows that it should work. And again, they've been great economists, great theoreticians that have shown us that it works. So, with all due respect to the economists, <laughs> and I am one to some extent, I'm a finance PhD, so I'm not quite an economist, but I, 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 I'm a minor, minor economist, if you will. I deal with a certain part of the economy. With all respect to the economists, the problem is not economics. The problem is not economic training, although we need it. Let me not diminish that. We need it. We need it. We need more of it. We need lots of it. But people are blinded by it anyway. They, they, they go to the best schools. They get the great economic education, and then they become statists, socialists of one form or another anyway, in spite of it. We need much more than economics. Economics is necessary, but not sufficient for the battle that we're engaged in, for the war, really, that we're engaged in. Economics is crucial. Economic knowledge is crucial. But it's not what drives the world. And uh, I, I think one of, the, one of the great challenges that economists have, uh, many economists that I've met, particularly in the United States, uh, and, and, uh, and many great economists, like people like Gary Becker and others, who believe that economics explains everything. And it doesn't. People care more about more than wealth. They care more than just about standard of living. I shouldn't say just because standard of living is important, but they care more about other things than about standard of living, about wealth creation. And the fact is that they care about the poor, or put it, put it, frame it a little differently, they know they should care about the poor. But whether they really care about the poor is, re is a real question. There are much more fundamental values that I believe we need to advocate for if we're going to achieve a free society. And my end is not wealth. I, I acknowledge this is where we defer. My end is not wealth. My end is individual freedom, and I emphasize individual freedom. My end is my freedom, even if you could show me economically that my freedom and each one of our individual freedom would lead to a lower standard of living, which I think, by the way, is impossible and I don't think would happen, I would still take the freedom. I would still take the freedom. So my end is different. But to reach that end, and I think by reaching that end, we also reach a higher standard of living and more wealth and the poor are better and everybody's better off, we need to recognize these values that people have need to acknowledge them, and need to deal with them. Now I'll give you one that is very relevant to Israeli society, and is becoming more and more relevant to American society, and certainly in Europe is much more similar to Israel, well, Israel than, than it is to the United States. And that is the notion, the idea, the ideal, if you will, of collectivism. We have to acknowledge the fact that Israel is fundamentally a collectivistic society. Now, what do I mean by collectivism? I don't mean uh, hanging around in a group and having a good time and being, uh, you know, a collective, if you will. I mean the philosophical idea that the standard by which we measure everything is the collective, the group, the public, Society. That society is the framework 
of lefts and we as individuals are just tools to get to a better society to get to a better common good to get to fulfill the so-called public interest I think this is a very very bad idea an idea that is you know in Israel it's 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 part of the mother's milk we drink when we're babies it's in the songs we sing when we're little kids it's in the stories we are told I mean of all the things I had to overcome to get to the philosophical position I, ha I have today collectivism specifically Jewish collectivism was the hardest of all because it was so ingrained in us from when we were so small but it is a deadly idea because at its core it teaches us to believe that our lives are meaningless as individuals that what matters is the group and you hear it and this is this is something that that is common in the world generally and this is something that has existed from the beginning of time right? I mean, and, and there's certain interest groups of course that have an interest in you believing that you are nothing that what matters is the group every tribal leader in history has wanted you to believe that and by the way who knows what's good for the group he does and if he's not sure exactly or he can't convince you very effectively he hires a witch doctor and the witch doctor and him one takes care of the material side of the group and the other takes care of the spiritual side of the group and you're all ultimately slaves to those two and this has been a pattern throughout human history a pattern throughout human history again that has said your life is not yours it's not yours to live your life belongs to the tribe your life belongs to the king your life belongs to the state your life belongs to God or to the Pope but it doesn't above all belong to you and of course by that standard what is good for people what is good for the public what is the common good who is the common anybody hear the common you guys the public I mean I know that you're not the public you're the tiniest minority within the public and therefore you're always gonna get screwed and of course who's the smallest minority always An individual each one of you is a minority the smallest minority so what becomes of this common good public interest collectivism when you add in democracy what you get is gang warfare not warfare with fists warfare with votes but warfare with votes turns into fists because the government is a fist let's not forget what the essential nature of government is the essential nature of government is coercion the essential nature of government is force George Washington said that in his uh, second inaugural address government is force now force can be used for good to protect us to defend us to arbitrate between disputes to define objective laws and property rights and so on but guns for the most part are used for evil to control us to tax us to regulate us to tell us how what we should believe in so we have to be very careful with this force but when you combine the public interest with democracy what you get is gangs and you see it in Israeli politics it's exactly what it is it's a bunch of little groups all with a little agenda all getting together and who are they gonna screw in the end the individual because the individual is not even there he doesn't exist it's blind to them they are you know they have to appease their group of voters and this group has to appease their group of voters and even their group is not homogeneous so collectivism always leads to statism and it leads to the lying and it leads to the to the you know pulling up and raising up the people who support your cause whether they've got PhDs in economics or not you call them what you need to call them in order to get your way and people who believe in the common good people who believe in the public interest have never thought history had a problem in lying through their teeth to get what they want I mean just think of every authoritarian regime in history it's always been it's always been for whom yeah it's great for the common good so the public interest I'm not doing this for me God forbid right 
I'm doing it for you. I just happen to channel, right, the public interest. I know it's in the public interest and I'm going to impose it on you. So, in my view, as long as we hold a collectivist view of the supremacy of the group, as long as we hold a view that even includes such a concept as the public interest, because I don't believe there is such a thing as the public interest, even in this room, there's not a uniform interest. Even in this room, there's not unanimity about almost anything. And this is a relatively homogeneously ideological group or values group, and we still don't agree, right? So there's no such thing as the common good, the public interest. As long as we hold those ideas, we lose. We lose. You know, one of the things that really gets me is, um, is this whole inequality debate. Right? And, and I assume it's happening in Israel because I saw a presentation where inequality uh, numbers were shown. Uh, and the debate infuriates me. Because my response to inequality is, who cares? Why is it relevant to anything? Because it's not. How somebody else is doing relative to me is irrelevant to me. Now, if he's stealing, lying, and cheating to get where he is, then that's a problem. But the problem is not the gap. The problem is that he's stealing, lying, and cheating. Cronyism is a problem. The, the inability of poor people to rise up, because in my view, government, a rise up into middle class order to become richer is a problem. There are lots of problems. I'm not denying the existence of problems. But inequality is not a problem. Whether it's growing or shrinking or flat, who cares? It's irrelevant. But you see, if you're a collectivist, it's very important. Because a collectivist views a pie. We've got GDP. We've got national assets. We've got national income. And now we need to decide how to divide it. And who gets what? And we need to divide it so that what? So that we achieve equality, or that we achieve uh, efficiency, or that we achieve something else. But what pie? I don't see a pie. I see your stuff, and your stuff, and I see you working hard, and I see you're really, really lazy, and not producing anything. <laughs> I see individual creation, but I don't see a pie. And I don't see why it's my job to divvy it up. You created yours, and you created yours. Good for you. Hey, and if I trade with you, maybe I can grow my pie. But as long as we view things in this collectivistic way, which unfortunately economics lends itself to do because it's about aggregation, right? It, it makes it easier if we start aggregating. But I think in the aggregation, we fall into a real danger, a danger of wiping out the individual and giving credence to the idea that there is such a thing as national income. There isn't. There's no national income. There's your income and my income and his income. Yeah, we can add it up, but adding it up is meaningless. So I think to really fight for liberty, to really lay a foundation for liberty, we have to reject collectivism. And what we need to embrace is a philosophy of individualism. And in this sense, this is not a new project. This is a project started way back, but in, in modern times, if you will, it was a project really started in the Enlightenment. A project started by the thinkers of the Enlightenment, the age of reason, who elevated knowledge and reason and thinking and being rational, elevated it to being supreme. It's the time of the rev scientific revolution. We can know reality, we can explain reality, we can understand reality. But who understands reality? Who knows reality? Who has reason? Who thinks? Only the individual. There's no collective consciousness. There's no group think. There's no floating something. We can help each other think. That's great. I'm all for helping each other think. We can stimulate each other to think. We can engage in conversation, which is wonderful. But at the end of the day, you have to think. I have to think or no thought happens. We don't think together. And of course, the Enlightenment recognizes this. And out of the Enlightenment comes the whole idea of individualism, out of John Locke and out of the thinkers following, comes the idea of reason and individualism as the two foundational principles of Western civilization. And I think those are the two foundational principles of Western civilization, reason and individualism. And individualism doesn't mean 
going off on a desert island and living by yourself. That's just plain stupid. Because clearly the benefits of associating with other people, both on a spiritual level, of friendship and love and relationships and just the fun of being around people, is a huge value. Not to mention the economic value of division of labor and specialization, which Adam Smith elaborated on, that raises your own well-being. Just the fact that you're in a community that's producing is incredibly valuable. So individualism doesn't mean isolationism. It doesn't mean going off and not caring about anybody and I'm just going to do my thing and turn my back on everybody else. No, it means engaging in the world, being part of the world, embracing the world, loving the world. That's what individualism is. But individualism says that the standard of value is not the group. It's the individual. It's each one of us. That the standard of the good is what's good for the individual. The standard for political good, the point of politics, the existence of government, is to protect the individual, to allow the individual to be free so he can pursue his life, so he can pursue his values, so he can make his life what he wants. You know, some of us choose to make a lot of money, some of us get PhDs and choose not to make a lot of money. Right? Some of us choose to teach because we love teaching. I love teaching. Right? I could be on Wall Street. But no, this is much more fun than making money. It's not about money. That's another thing the left likes to describe us as. We, you know, individualists, they all, all they want is money, right? On the desert island. <laughs> I don't know what you can do with the money on the desert island. <laughs> but the whole idea is to create government, to create a society that leaves the individual free. And societies exist as an abstraction, right? They just don't exist as a metaphysical reality. Only individuals exist as a metaphysical reality. Society is an abstraction, and we need that abstraction. But what we need to recognize is that the only reason to get together is not to loot from one another, not to steal from one another, not to kill one another, but to trade at every level, spiritual and material. To create, to build, to make stuff, to grow. And we need to be protected. And this is, again, out of the Enlightenment comes this idea that the only role of government is to protect us from the fact that there are bad guys. There are always bad guys. In every group, there's a bad person who will use force, who will try to steal, who will try to cheat, who will commit fraud. And that the role of government is to protect us from those bad guys, external and internal to our own group. And other than that, you know, we're also going to get into disputes. We're going to disagree once in a while, even, even if we're completely rational. And even contracts can be ambiguous, and sometimes there's a real dispute. Somebody has to be the referee at the end. That's it. The purpose of government in the Enlightenment, according to the Enlightenment thinkers, was that the protection of our freedoms. And they articulated this in a concept, one concept, which I think is the core of what we need politically to fight for. Individualism, if you will, immorality. And the core political principle is individual rights. And I know it's been corrupted by the left, but that's what they do. They take words and they flip them. Justice. What does justice mean? Fairness. What does fairness mean? You always get, you know, replace one word with another. Oh, what does fairness mean in the common... It means equality today, right? Fairness means equality. But it never used to. Fairness meant, used to mean, in the old days, right? Even I remember those. Fairness used to mean getting what you deserve. Justice meant getting what you deserve. You're bad, you get bad. Right? You're good, you get rewarded. That's what fairness used to mean. And the left has taken that term and it flipped it on us and turned it into inequality, which according to the old definition is unjust. I actually think that the idea of equality of outcome is the most evil idea in human history. And if you're interested in some good examples of why, I would be happy to give it to you uh, in the Q&A, if we have time for it. So, 
We can't give up on the concept of individual rights any more than we can give up on the concept of justice. We have to redefine it. And individual rights is the recognition that your life does not belong to the group. Individual rights is the recognition that to the extent that we form a group and form a government, the purpose is to protect your life. Individual rights is the recognition that you are free. Free to act on your own behalf. Free to pursue your values. Free to make whatever decisions you want, good and bad. You, if you have a right to life, by the way, you have to have a right to commit suicide. That's what it means to have a right to life. And some people commit suicide quickly, some people commit suicide slowly. But they have a right to commit suicide slowly. I'm, I'm for legalizing drugs, by the way, all drugs. Uh, but I recognize that actually doing that will increase the number of people who, who commit suicide slowly. But they have a right to do that. It's their life, it's not mine. And it's not yours. And it's not the government's. It's their life. That's the whole point. It's individuals. So we need to resurrect this concept of individual rights. And of course, this period of the Enlightenment, it's a crowning achievement, in my view. It's great success story is the establishment of the United States of America. In 1776, you could even say that's around the time when the Enlightenment is about to end, tragically for humankind. But they established a government, at least in their idea. There were, always, there were flaws and there were inconsistencies, but in the idea was the principle of government there to protect us, and that's it. Leave us alone otherwise. So I mind you, this is the foundation. The foundation is already there. It's already in the founding of America. What the founders did not have, in my view, is a moral grasp of what it completely meant. It's a moral philosophy to ground their individualism and their freedom and their individual rights. But I think we have that now. I think that's Ayn Rand's great achievement. She's given us that philosophy. She's given us that foundation. We have no excuses anymore. You can, the philosophical foundations for individualism, for individual rights, are there. Read the virtue of selfishness, capitalism, unknown ideal. She has done it. There's a lot of work still needs to be done in the philosophy, but the principles are all in existence. What we need is to embrace those principles, to talk about them, to educate people in it. So that we couple the economic understanding that freedom works, and it does, and we can show it, and we can prove it, with the notion that freedom is right, freedom is just, freedom is good, freedom is virtuous. Why? Because your life is yours. It doesn't belong to anybody else. And in my view, in my view, this is a powerful message to young people. Young people are looking for answers, they're looking for truths, they're looking to understand their own lives and their own world. And when you're 16, when I was 16, when you guys were 16, when you're 16, to, I don't know, somewhere in your 20s, you're searching. And you're not just searching for material things, you're searching to, under, you're searching to understand the world and, and you're searching to figure out your place within the world. Am I just a cog in this machine? What is my relationship to the state, the group, the tribe? And I think a message that says that the most fundamental thing in terms, of, in terms of our lives is that your life is yours. Your life is yours. And there are objective standards by which you can live to make that life a success. Objective truths in morality they can help you make your life the best life that it can be. That is a powerful message for a young person. And oh, by the way, if we all practice that, if we all engaged in that pursuit of our own self-interest, of our own life, of our own flourishing, you get rich too. In a sense of we all get richer because we have a free society and we know the results of a free society. That is an exciting message for young people. That's something people can get engaged with. That's something that can change the world. So let's go change it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, we've got time for a few questions. Yeah.
אני שואל בעברית. איך אתה משנה בעצם חברה שהיא כמו ישראל, שאנשים נמדו בעצם בגיל אפס בצורה לא בצורה קולקטיביסטית, ואנשים לא תמיד, הם לא יודעים אפילו שקיימת בגלל זה שבא אחרת. אוקיי, אז השאלה היא... איך מתקנים, איך אפשר לתקן כזה, להתקן את הכסף? So the question is, how do you change a culture, particularly a culture like Israel, where collectivism is so embedded and, and so part of the way we grow up? And unfortunately, uh, there is no easy answer to that, and there's no magic bullet. If there was one, I would be shooting it already, right? There just isn't. This is hard work. And this is education, education, education. There is no alternative to speaking and talking, and more importantly maybe than anything else, writing, even though people don't read anymore. If they don't read anymore, we've lost. <laughs> we have to write, we have to communicate. But my point is, we need to continue communicating all the economic ideas, but what we don't have, what nobody does, is we need to start communicating these more fundamental philosophical ideas. And I want to say something about, um, Who's to blame for all this, right? So, the, so it's the media. We talked about the media and um, an economist. No, it was the media and economist. So, so I have a, a different view of kind of uh, how ideas spread. Uh, I think the I think the most important people in a culture are, as bizarre as it might seem, the philosophers. I think they dictate everything. So that the reason good economists are ignored is because most of the people in the media took philosophy classes, or sociology classes, or English classes, the humanities classes that are all very influenced by philosophy. And they're all postmodernists. And postmodernism says there is no reality, there is no truth. Certainly we don't know the truth. So, you know, this economist, that economist, you have a PhD, you don't have a PhD, what's the difference? It's all opinion anyway. There's no reality. Now that's subtle, but it's true. That's how philosophy sneaks in every way. So that people don't really think there is a truth. So, for example, in education, in America at least, we take 10-year-olds uh, and we put them around in a circle and ask them what they think about the current political events. What does a 10-year-old think about anything? He doesn't know anything. He has an opinion about politics? That's bizarre. I mean, 18-year-olds should barely be allowed to speak about politics. That was supposed to be fun, but okay. Um, right, but a 10-year-old? But, but, but it's not about facts. It's not about truth. It's not about science. It's about opinion. And that comes straight from postmodernism. And postmodernism comes from Immanuel Kant, through a lot of other philosophers, and through Foucault and Sartre and all the people Israelis love to read. They're the enemy. And if you, if you really want to get deeply into this, in a sense, all of Western civilization is a battle between two philosophers. All of our history is a battle between two philosophers. Plato. And Aristotle. And collectivism and statism and socialism and fascism and all of that is Plato. Straight out of the Republic, straight out of the whole idea that we just live in a cave and we see shadows. And we need philosopher kings who actually commune with the truth to let us know what reality really is. Versus Aristotle, who facts are facts, reality is the first scientist. He got his science all wrong. Almost everything he said in science is wrong. But he established the scientific method. And that's why he's the great, one of the reasons he's the greatest philosopher ever. He invented logic. And our side is about logic. It's about facts. It's about reality. But if people out there think the reality, who knows what reality is? We don't see reality anyway. You know, we, need, we need to commune with the spirits to know what reality is. Then of course we're going to lose because we're about logic and facts and, and reason. right? So we have to elevate reason, facts, logic before we can even have any other discussion. discussion. So in that sense, all this is really, really, really hard. So there's no easy, but it's education, education, education. And because the left dominates the universities, we have to find alternative ways to get to people. And, and my, my hope, my only hope, I think, is that we find a way to use the internet really, really, really well. We find a way to use the internet brilliantly in order to get our ideas around academia, which is so dominantly left. And, and let me just recommend two books. Uh, one is Read Ayn Rand, because I think she's really, really important. And I know some of you probably started out the struggle and didn't finish. There are lots of other books. Read Ayn Rand. 
And second, there's a wonderful book about Plato and Aristotle, which I think is, is, is really uh, useful in this debate. I don't agree with everything in it, but it's very useful. It's called The Cave and the Light, which is, which is a description of the periods in which Plato wins versus the periods in which Aristotle wins in the interchange between the two throughout, throughout history. Yep. You started with Hong Kong as an example, which is supposed to be This is my this is my whole point. Yes, no, I know. It's, uh, my point is that people don't learn from experience. They don't learn from history. They don't learn through their eyes. They don't learn. Because in, in, when, we, when we deal with politics, when we deal with political systems, yes, companies mimic successful strategies that others do. Countries do not. They do not. Now, some do to some extent. Like the Asian tigers, to a large extent, mimicked. The Singapore-Hong Kong model was mimicked later by South Korea and Taiwan and even to some extent Thailand and some of the others and China certainly. But this is the point. The point is that public policy does not get determined by what works. We know what works. Hong Kong, we've got a great economist. We, we can explain what works. People don't care what works. What they want is what you said feels good, which is true. But that feeling good is driven by their collectivistic morality and by sense of collectivism. Therefore, what I'm saying is that's what needs to be challenged. Until we challenge that, until we knock collectivism, that is, the idea that your life doesn't mean anything except in the context of a group, that idea needs to be crushed. It needs to be trashed in a, in a heap of history. It is an evil, evil idea. Nobody's asked me about equality. It's a really evil idea and we need to eliminate it and only then can you start talking about what works? What's good for the individual? How do I become wealthy or more prosperous? How do I get a, a better standard of living? Only then can we look at Hong Kong and say, ah, that's a pretty good model. According to your uh, individualistic uh, ideology, why should we ever go and fight in the army and uh, potentially endanger our good, lives? Good question. So why would you ever go into the army if you're an individualist? Because you're an individualist. In other words, you care about your life. And because you care about your life, you care about your freedom. You want to be free. You realize to what extent freedom is necessary for you to have a successful life. So you would fight for a country that guarantees that freedom. I don't believe in joining an army to fight for a bad country. I don't believe in risking your life for a bad cause. I am not a patriot of a geography or of an ethnic group. I'm a patriot for ideas. So if the country that I am in upholds my freedom, protects me, defends me, and I can live and live the best life that I can have, love the people I love, watch my children grow up free, then I'm willing to fight for that. I'm willing to, to kill the people who try. By the way, I would fight differently than we fight today. I would fight to win because I value my life too much to risk it in the cause of a tie or a draw or a loss. So the only reason to go to war is to win it. There's never any reason to go to war for any other reason. Uh, I love General, General, I'll end with this on, on this point. I love General Sherman who won the Civil War for America. And General Sherman said, war is hell. And I would add, if you're not make, willing to make it hell, stay home. Yeah. Uh, I would like to hear your uh, opinion about inequality. Yeah, let me tell you, I, I'm not going to give you the whole my opinion on inequality because I'm writing a book on it. You'll get that book next year. It's, it's almost done. Yeah, it's, uh, the publisher's already, we've got a contract. It will come out early next year. But I'll give you why I think equality is the most evil ideology ever. Because it is an attempt 
to fight a metaphysical fact. The metaphysical fact is we're all unequal. That's the way we are. Isn't life beautiful? I mean, imagine if we were all equal. How horrible would that be? I mean, I don't want to be the same as all you guys. I mean, I don't want lots of Urons running around. I love the fact that we're different. Our differences make us unequal, metaphysically. And I give, I, I give a couple examples. I'll give, give you this example. Uh, I'm an awful basketball player, right? But I, I demand, I want, I feel like I have a right to get on a court with LeBron James and play one-on-one -on -one basketball and have a chance of winning. You want to be as rich as Bill Gates, right? I want to play basketball with LeBron James. Well, how do we do that? Because LeBron James is like a gazillion times better than me. So how do we do it? How do we make us equal? Tie his hands. You haven't seen me play. <laughs> you got to break his legs. I mean, let's be honest here, right? You got to break his legs, maybe one arm. Now, we laugh. You laugh. But I don't laugh, because that's exactly what's being done to us in the name of equality. I work hard for the money I own. Money is a reflection of time and effort, and brain power, and a lot of other things, of your productive ability. But it, fundamentally, it's time. I work hard. And every year, some bureaucrat sticks his hand in my pocket and takes 50% of my money. Now that is 50% of my time which represents 50% of my life. They're stealing my life from me. They're stealing your life away from you. As Corinne earlier showed, right? You spend half your life working for the government and the other half working for yourself. Well, that's theft in a brutal way, all in the name of equality. Now, if you gave me a choice between having my legs broken once a year or having 50% of my money taken from me, I'm not sure which choice I would make. I mean, that's how much I value my money. So, breaking LeBron James's legs is not funny. It's done every single day to every single one of us. And that's how you have to think of inequality. The idea that inequality is bad and we're gonna do it, 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 you always have to think, what are they gonna do about it? They're gonna break people's legs. That's what they wanna do, to create equality. The only way to make us equal is to destroy us. And to destroy anybody who's a successful. Like in Australia, they say chop down the tall poppies. Anybody who sticks up, you chop them down. And I'll, I'll end, uh, again, I'll, I'll give you this brutal example. There's one regime in human history who took this to the limit. They dedicated to themselves to the ideal of equality. They studied in Paris, right? They were students of Jean-Paul Sartre and Abel Camus. They took their philosophy seriously and they went back home and they took over the government and they said, we're gonna establish equality. But the problem is, people are not equal, so what do we do? Well, some people live in the fields and some people live in the cities, so that's not equal, so we empty the cities. We drive them all out into the field. But you know what, even in the fields, some people are better at foraging for food than other people. Foraging is going to pick, pick food, right? So we ban foraging. We shoot anybody who's caught foraging. But still, some people have an education and some people don't. How do you make that equal? You shoot everybody who has an education. Some people are smart, some people are not. You shoot everybody who's smart. Some people, uh, as a reflection of being smart, wear glasses. So we shoot everybody with glasses. Now this happened. This is the killing fields of Cambodia. This is exactly what motivated Pop Pop. And this is why, to this day, there are intellectuals all over the world who still justify Pol Pot, because he fought for an ideal that all of us, oh, not all of us in this room, but all of them out there believe in equality. There's only one meaning to the term equality. Really, really important. Only one meaning to the word equality. Everything else is what, what Ayn Rand called an anti-concept. Everything else is illegitimate. And the one meaning of equality in politics is equality of freedom, equality of rights, in a sense, equality before the law. We're all born free. We're all born with liberty. We're all born, in a sense, owning our own lives. But once we're born, the outcome, what we do, how we do it, all of that is going to be unequal, and that's great. We should celebrate inequality. Because it's, it is. That's life. That's, the human, that's human beings. We done. Thank you all. Thank you.
מתכבד בזו לחתום את, ה... את אירועי כנס החירות השני. אני מודה לכל מי שהגיע, מעריך מאוד את הסטמינה של כל מי שנשאר, ואני בטוח שעכשיו קיבלתם עוד אנרגיה לשנה של פעילות קדימה על מנת להמשיך לקדם את רעיונות החירות, השוק החופשי והשגשוג שהגיע איתם.